your questions at the end of the webinar. So my name is Ben Hilly. I'm the brand experience manager here at Weston. I'm also on our design team. I manage our backcountry guide program and all of our educational programs. So I've been a guide for about 10 years and I've been with Weston. This will be my sixth season now with Weston. So I'm really stoked that you guys all tuned in tonight and look forward to sharing a little more about the backcountry with you all. We've also got Justin Ibarra here tonight. Justin is the lead splitboard guide at Colorado Adventure Guides. He's also the owner of Colorado Snowboard Guides. I believe he's been a guide for about 14 seasons now, and he is a fantastic resource for anybody here in the Colorado area or really anybody abroad. Um, definitely reach out to Justin if you have questions tonight. What's up, guys? Justin here tuning in uh, from good old Silverthorne, Colorado. Excited to see all you guys here tuning in for the evening. Um, towards the end of the presentation, we'll be giving our contact information. So as Ben said, love to be a continual resource for you guys. So looking forward to the presentation ahead. You. Next up, we have Pat Gebhardt. Pat is also a guide with Colorado Adventure Guides. Pat has been a guide for about three years, but he's been snowboarding over two decades. Originally a freestyle background, Pat is really into splitboard mountaineering, and you can often find him climbing throughout the summers. Um, he is a fantastic resource if someone's getting into splitboarding. So we'll let Pat say hello as well. Hey, greetings, everyone. As Justin said, um, feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, here's my Instagram handle. Uh, definitely love to chat on Instagram if you have any questions and uh, stoked to uh, help everybody get to up to speed with the backcountry on this talk. Yeah, buddy. We're stoked to have Pat. And last but not least, we've got Sarah McGregor. Sarah is a fantastic split board guide. She works for San Juan Expeditions, Colorado Mountain School, and a whole list of other guide services that I can't remember off the top of my head, but definitely reach out to Sarah. She's been guiding 13 years now and is just an amazing guide. She runs a whole slew of female specific programs all over the state of Colorado. Uh, so definitely reach out to her if you've got questions tonight. All right. Hey, everyone. It's nice to be here. Thanks so much for tuning in and really look forward to connecting with anyone who's interested outside of this chat tonight. Perfect. And, you know, first off, who is Weston? We are an award-winning ski and snowboard and splitboard manufacturer based here in Minturn, Colorado. We really try to translate our backcountry values into our business, and we spend most of our time supporting our local backcountry community. We support programs like ARI, 1% for the Planet, the National Forest Foundation, and I'd go as far to say, you know, we probably support more nonprofit backcountry forecasting and avalanche education programs than any other brand out there. So that's, that's really where we spend the bulk of our time, the bulk of our events. Um, the bulk of our athlete support is, is professional guides, forecasters, and the backcountry community in general. Tonight, we're going to be discussing, you know, the reasons that we get into the backcountry and ski and splitboard in the first place. Why we, you know, or what the differences between splitboard and alpine touring skis are compared to a normal resort board or ski setup. We're going to briefly discuss different avalanche education resources that are out there and even highlight some great local programs and local guides that you can reach out to to actually take some courses. We're going to touch on first aid, which is another big part of handling yourself in the backcountry and being prepared. We'll briefly discuss fitness and give you guys some recommendations on how to get into the sport at a good fitness level and, and really know what to expect on your first tour. And then we're going to kind of give you a curriculum or our recommended next steps, what you really should be doing to pursue, you know, the, this sport of backcountry riding and skiing. So really a lot of stuff. So let's just get into it. Um, first off, you know, who has been backcountry skiing or riding before? Um, we've just launched a poll that you guys can answer here. And you've got a few different choices here. And let's see kind of where our audience lies here. 
we've got a few addicted to back countries already. So that's good. We've, we've got a few seasoned riders in here tonight, but it looks like about half of our audience tonight are kind of beginners looking to get into the back country. So that's perfect. Really, we're going to cover stuff for everybody. Um, these guides are a wealth of knowledge. Um, so, you know, really feel free, reach out to them and we're definitely going to cover a lot of great stuff tonight, but you know, it looks like about, we've got about half of us, 45% have never been out in the back country and we've got about 30% that have been out once or twice. Awesome guys. Well, again, thank you all for, for tuning in tonight. This is great to see. So why even get into the backcountry in the first place? Uh, you know, there's a lot of great reasons. I certainly remember my first big exploration into the backcountry, and it's something that stuck with me the rest of my life. Um, powder, you know, uh, chasing powder. That's really the main reason for a lot of us to get into the, the backcountry. The powder highway was where I fell in love with split boarding and backcountry travel. Exploration. You know, if you like touring around or, or checking out places in the summer, hiking up 14ers, this is a great way to explore your backyard. And uh, to this day, I've got a list of 10 places that I want to check out this winter that I've, you know, explored a little bit in the summer. Friendship, my backcountry partners, uh, my main backcountry partner is my best friend. He's the guy that officiated my wedding. Uh, friendships that you build in the backcountry are, are much deeper than, than your normal friendship because these are the people that you rely on to save your life in an accident. Fitness, uh, split boarding, backcountry skiing, if you want to stay in shape, hike up and down mountains all winter um, and you will stay in shape. If you happen to have a gear addiction like myself, um, split boarding and backcountry skiing, you know, there's a whole lot of great gear you can buy as, as long as your wife doesn't get mad at you. Uh, you, can, you can buy a whole lot of gear, so a, a good addiction to support. We've also got extended seasons. Um, we've got some guides that, you know, split board or backcountry ski year round. I know guys, you know, on three or four years right now that they've been out every single month and they, you're, you can do that here in Colorado and a lot of other places around the U.S. and around the world. No more snowshoes. This is kind of the big one. This is, is where backcountry, specifically split boarding came from. We used to hike up the mountain with snowshoes and no more snowshoes. Summits. These are, these are some of the, the most amazing places you'll ever experience. Again, if you like visiting the tops of mountains in the summer, the winter is even more fun when you get to do one of your favorite things on the way down. High fives, I think that goes without saying. And I think our big one this year is no lift lines, no crowds, right? Um, this is what I love probably the most about backcountry skiing and riding, being with a few of my closest friends out somewhere beautiful, new, in one of my favorite places and having no other humans around. So, you know, this is our backyard. Uh, this is chair five in Vail on a very busy day. So, you know, just start contrast to this and a, a typical day at a resort. So split boards and, and alpine touring or AT ski setups are, are really specialized pieces of equipment that allow users to travel efficiently uphill and through snowy conditions to their desired zones for skiing or riding. A basic setup consists of a split board or skis, binding, skins, and poles, right? So those are your basic things that you need. And tour mode is used for uphill travel, AKA skinning or touring, similar to the function of a snowshoe, you know, and the ski and ride mode are the connected halves of a split board that form a standard snowboard for downhill travel and ski touring bindings basically just lock in the back and create, you know, basically what you're used to. So the, the tour mode is the, the huge difference here, right? Um, the ski and ride mode really looks very similar to what you're used to but these products really allow you to hike up a mountain and come back down safely. So this is a video from one of our other guides, Will Sperry. He's based over in California, guides for Golden State Guiding. And he's a great resource as well. Feel free to check him out on YouTube or on our guide page. All these guides tonight, you can get in contact with them via our guide page on our website as well. But Will here is going to kind of walk you through a transition and you can really see the difference between a normal resort setup or, you know, a split board or ski and this transition on a touring setup. You guys, I just got to the top of my climb. 
and I want to show you a few tricks for transitioning. Biggest trick to have is have a process. Have a way that you do it the same way every time, no matter what. So I get to the top, first thing I do, step out of my skis and adjust my boots for downhill mode. Then I'm gonna take my backpack off, and get it ready to receive any gear that I need to put in there. So it doesn't blow away in the wind. And I'm gonna rip my skins. Just like I showed you guys before. Attach my board together and put the bindings on. So, with the mid clips offset, I make a V, click it together, and slide up. Once I slide up, then I stick it in the snow, do my nose clip first, mid clip, rear mid clip and tail clip. And if you notice, I'm actively securing my board into the snow in every way I move it. I'm never setting it down. Because once the skins are off the board, now we have a slippery surface and it sucks if you lose your board after you just climb that whole way. So, boards together. Now I can grab my bindings. There's one. And two. So if it's calm out, kind of like it is right now, the last thing I'll do is put my helmet and goggles on so I don't fog them up before I start riding. But if it's really, really nasty out and really windy and snowing and coming in sideways, then maybe the first thing I do when I get to the top of the hill turtle shell and then I can brave elements a little easier when I have all that stuff on. So there we have it. Once we uh, do that, stow the poles, click in and shred on. So there you go. You know, as you can see, there's, you know, a little bit more involved there uh, than a typical resort setup, right? So, th so that was a split board being turned into ride mode for that downhill travel. Um, it's even more simple with skis. Um, and we'll kind of get into those details a little bit later, but as you can see, they're a lot different. And the main difference is this equipment is designed for uphill travel, right? So this is what you would typically see on a skin track, a nice group of skiers and split boarders all in a nice single file line on one skin track and a, a pretty tight group, you know, traveling at a, a good pace where they can all kind of keep that same pace. So this is kind of what a typical tour would look like. Um, a big note is split boards are not also downhill performance skis. These are two separate things. Um, while you do need to, to learn how to split ski to travel efficiently in the backcountry, they are not downhill skis, right? Two totally different products, um, but still a lot of fun to split ski, right? So there are a lot of um, 
pretty specific differences in the equipment from the boards to the bindings, even, you know, skins between skis and split boards. So I'm going to kind of kick it over to the guides here. First up, we have Sarah McGregor, and uh, I'm going to let her kind of walk through the differences between boards and skis, and we'll let her discuss some of the different bindings as well. So without any further ado, Sarah, I will let you take it away. Well, wow. thanks so much, Ben. Hi, everybody. So like we just saw, a slipboard is a snowboard that splits into two pieces so that you can travel uphill with it. Some major differences between a slipboard and a solid resort board. Um, the big one is it separates into two pieces, um, but there's a lot more. So originally slipboards were made by simply taking a regular solid board and sawing it down the center, then installing the hardware to make a backcountry setup for uphill travel. A board that wasn't designed to be cut in half, as you might expect, has greatly reduced performance. Uh, there are a ton of different shapes and designs of slipboards, but here are a few ways that manufactured slipboards can differ from solid boards. So slipboards feature things like inner metal, <laughs> inner metal edges and sidewalls, super durable top sheets, nose and tail connection systems, often referred to as J-clips, and the cores are closer in construction to a ski than a typical snowboard. Slipboard manufacturers often design their boards to be camber underfoot and to have a weighted tail for better touring capabilities. So there's a lot that goes into manufacturing a slipboard, so make sure to buy from a recommended manufacturer rather than splitting your own. We will be discussing board shapes and construction more in depth next week in our gear specific discussion. So be sure to tune in next week. When choosing your board, the main thing is to buy the right shape and size for your riding style and the terrain you like to ride, whether it be backcountry or resort, steeps or low angle pow, um, et cetera. It's always a good idea in general to size up your split board two to five centimeters and try out a few boards before you invest in a setup. There are a ton of demos and intro courses that you can check out that we'll be sure to tell you more about later in this chat. Cool, so next up we've got skis. The nice part about finding a pair of skis that you can use in the backcountry is that if you already have a ski that you use in the resort, you can use it as a reference point. You can usually start looking for a lightweight ski in the same length that you're already skiing, but don't be afraid to size up a couple centimeters if necessary, um, especially if you're used to a fully cambered front side groomer ski, going to a rocker camber all mountain touring ski can actually feel a little shorter if it's got a shorter camber zone. So generally your sizing up is going to come from the width of the ski. So unless you're already skiing a wider ski at the resort, if you've got an all mountain resort ski that you love, you can poten potentially just swap out the bindings for an AT binding to get started and step up up to a true backcountry setup as your skills progress. So to sum it up, don't size up in length necessarily, but think more about a wider ski and you'll want them relatively light yet sturdy enough to charge through the variable conditions that can occur in the backcountry. All right, bindings. Um, so number one, we highly recommend that you buy a split board specific binding and this may seem like a no-brainer to some, but it's worth stating so people, um, so people new to the sport uh, really understand kind of what you're getting into. There are adapter plate systems on the market that allow you to use the resort bindings you might already have, but they are pretty heavy, clunky, and are not as preferred of an option to get into the sport. So for the backcountry, we basically need a binding that allows your heel to lift up for the uphill and then you need it to lock back down for the downhill. There is a wide variety of great split board bindings on the market today and the technology has really come a long way over the past decade. The two main types of split board specific bindings are those used with soft boots and then those used with hard boots. So bindings compatible with soft boots, um, potentially the soft boots you already have are what we recommend as your first binding. So um, they're great because you can strap in and out just like 
you would in the resort and there's a pretty minimal learn learning curve. Hard booting, like in the video that we just saw, um, is a new trend among split borders and we'll get real into detail about that next week in our gear talk. Spark specifically, oh, all right, so this is a video um, of a spark binding. They've specifically carved out a really great niche for themselves for being reliable and user friendly um, um, among a lot of other reasons. So here is the, the binding connected to the board um, in split mode. So there's some heel risers. There's two different heights that you can choose. And you see the heel lifts up so that you can tour effectively uphill. And so now it's connected in ride mode. And it has really cool, easy features so you can adjust the forward lean of your high back for performance on the downhill. And then you'll want it to be able to, ro um, to articulate a little further back for the uphill. Um, so you would just flip that switch right back up when you move it back into touring mode. So there it is in touring mode. So you have a lot more range of motion with the high back a little farther back. They are compatible with um, these Ibex crampons, which is a really cool tool if you are getting into some harder your terrain. So this is a new feature that I haven't had the pleasure of trying out yet, but having the heel lock is a huge progression in flipboard technology so that you can effectively split ski, which is a skill that's very useful specifically if the skin track starts moving downhill or if you have to perform a rescue. Nice. Cool. So moving on to Alpine Touring Bindings, also known as AT Bindings. There are two main types of AT Bindings, uh, frame and tech. So you can use your standard resort boot in a frame binding. It locks in and the whole binding essentially releases allowing free movement of the, hill, of the heel for uphill. An old type of frame binding called Alpine Trekkers, I'm not sure if anybody's ever heard of those or used them. Um, they used to be nicknamed day wreckers because of their weight and exceptional ability to fail in the backcountry. Frame bindings have since come a long way. And um, even though they have come a long way, they're still generally not preferred due to the exertion required to lift the whole binding with each step, as well as the inherent weight of a standard Alpine boot but that is a way that you can use your Alpine boot um, in, in the backcountry. But the other style is tech bindings, which require a specific tech boot. Um, and they rely on two pins on the binding that hold two dimples in your boot in place for touring. The heel is then free to pivot and is locked down for skiing. While this may seem like a flimsy system, the recent advancements in technology have greatly improved the ski performance of this style of binding and has become the standard um, in the backcountry, largely because they're significantly lighter and the boots are lighter too. So there is a new type of binding um, as well that is a hybrid, it's called the Solomon Shift. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second, but right now we're gonna be able to see uh, kind of how one type hey, of tech binding backcountryskiincanada.com and today we're here to talk about the Marker Alpinist 12 binding. So this is a new binding from Marker. It arrived on the scene last season. Before this Marker had the F10 and the F12 which were both frame bindings. Then they came out with a kingpin which had the same tech toe but an alpine heel. So this is the first true tech binding from Marker. It weighs in at 335 grams or 245 grams without the brake, and that's per binding. The brakes weigh about 90 grams, so a nice addition, but a super lightweight pure tech binding from Marker, which is an awesome binding for those people that want to go dedicated ski touring on a nice light ski touring ski as well. It's got a release value of 6 to 12, 
Brake widths come in 90, 105, and 112 millimeters. And then the risers on this binding, this one is set up in tour mode. So in tour mode, you've got five degrees or 31 millimeters of riser. And if you turn the heel to it, that's where you find your zero riser. And then your nine degree or 40 millimeters of height there. The uh, adjustment on the back is 15 millimeters. And then you've got a forward elasticity travel of four millimeters. The U-spring in the binding itself, in the back here, takes care of the vertical release. And then there's also a low and medium uh, spring available, depending on what release you want. Um, then the toe piece up front here has a lockout as well, made for climbing. So this is in climbing mode here. And it's made out of a forged aluminum and carbon fiber reinforced polyamide plastic. So it keeps things really, really light. So overall, a super lightweight tech binding from Marker, new last year, highly recommended. Ideal for lightweight ski like this, like the Blizzard Zero G 105 that we also reviewed on the site. Price is $499.99 Canadian or $395 US. So check this binding out. The full review is on our website and you can find other AT binding reviews, skis, boots, and other things to do with backcountry skiing on the site. Thanks very much. Sweet. Um, so the, that was not the hybrid. I saw a question come in. Um, an example of a hybrid binding is uh, the Salomon Shift. And pretty cool because it allows you to you to tour on a tech system but ski in an alpine binding um, so it's a great quiver system but tend to be slightly heavier than true tech bindings though they really are pushing the limits of the technology in terms of weight so they're pretty cool if, if that's if you already have a you know a boot that fits your foot I know that can be one of the hardest parts is finding um, you know a new boot that'll fit the, these special tech bindings um, so yeah the next up is boots and I'm going to pass it over to Justin Ibarra of Colorado Adventure Guides um, and remember to keep letting us know throughout this talk if you have any questions and thanks so much again for tuning in awesome how's it going everybody and thank you Sarah looking okay here all right cool so boots guys um we'll start off with splitboarding boots uh first and foremost splitboarding boots are not going to be mandatory for traveling into the backcountry they're going to be kind of the bottom of the barrel when we're talking about what kind of gear we want to acquire before we start venturing out the backcountry so um just keep that in mind not something you need to stress on off the bat if you're just getting into the backcountry uh, but here are a few key points we can highlight um, because there are a handful of manufacturers out there who are making split board specific boots, both soft boot and now hard boot here. So a um, few of these key points here with the specific split board boots, you're going to often find that they are more durable than your um, resort boot. We put a lot more abuse on those guys um, and oftentimes they're stiffer as well. Um, you can also have some special features on these boots as far as a heel welt, which is gonna make it um, semi-automatic crampon compatible for more of your spring um, snowboarding or splitboarding mountaineering objectives. Um, there's also a couple other features you can find like the Jones uh, 32 boot that came out has um, articulation added to the back of the cuff, which is uh, allows you to have a little bit longer of a stride. Um, and then also on most of these splitboard specific boots, you're gonna find a stiffer sole a lot of them are vibrant. Um, and then the, the lace style, you're gonna find both your traditional lace and you're gonna find your boa. Uh, personally on the soft boot market, I, I like the lace because the boa, if it breaks in the back country, can, you know, you're kind of, it's gonna be a little bit harder to deal with. Um, and so some of the examples of um, manufacturers that are making these split board specific hard boots or soft boots, excuse me, are uh, Fitwell, um, Solomon 32 and Deluxe. Um, and yeah, that kind of hits our, our soft boots for split boarding. And then beyond that, you're also going to have hard boots, which you saw Will on earlier, um, which is basically a ski boot like you see right here. Um, and then this, my plug real quick for Phantom, um, which is a hard boots binding and hard boot binding interface. They are just coming out with the first manufactured split board specific hard boot this season. So highly recommend you guys check that out. Um, so that's kind of your split board boots. Again, reiterating, not necessary to get into the backcountry. Now we'll kick it over here to your AT ski touring boots. On the flip side, this is a boot you are going to want to get before touring into the backcountry. 
you're going to find a greater range of motion. They're going to be a little bit lighter weight. Um, and the biggest one of the things is you're going to be able to go from um, walk mode to ski mode, so your ankle flexes, and then also your tech toe on those guys also. So that'll kind of cover the boots here for us. Next thing we'll get into is skins. Uh, if you guys don't know what skins are, skins are what is going to allow you to ascend up the mountain before you either uh, strap back into snowboard mode or downhill for ski mode. Um, so using for uphill travel here, um, on the split boarding side, definitely recommend that you get a split board specific skin, which there's a handful of manufacturers out there that who are making those. And most of those are gonna come with a specific tail clip that'll fit uh, on the split board a little bit better. Um, once you get them, you're gonna have to trim them. Most of them come with a trimming tool. Just take your time, it's pretty easy to do. Uh, the big thing with the skins is you do wanna take care of them. If you take care of them, they should last you a few seasons. Um, you wanna make sure you're not getting debris and so forth on the underside of it, which is where the glue is at. Um, so take care of them. Um, and the material you're gonna find on those, you're gonna see uh, mohair and nylon are your two main material types for the skins. And the most efficient, typically you're gonna find out there is a good mixture of the mohair and nylon. So they have different properties to them and we'll get into those more uh, next week when we delve more into the gear. So that'll kind of wrap up the skins here for you. Uh, next thing we'll get into is going to be our avalanche gear. This is an absolute requirement you must have before you go into the backcountry every day. And very important that you make sure that all your touring partners are all equipped with it as well. Um, so those pieces of gear that we're going to be looking for are what we call our BSP, your beacon, your shovel, and your probe. And another thing I usually like to throw in there is an R for radio communication and teamwork are our two best friends in the backcountry. Um, so kind of highlighting a few of these guys here, your beacon uh, or your transceiver, usually what I like to call them there. Um, it's basically what allows you to find and be found if you found yourself underneath the snow in an avalanche. So very important to make sure you're gonna carrying a beacon. Uh, many models, many manufacturers out there, make sure you get a free antenna beacon check your batteries, read the manual, know how to use it, take an avalanche class, and um, we'll delve more into the beacon side when we get into week two here with gear. Um, shovel is the, the next part of the, the stool here. Um, for shovel, just a, key, a few key takeaways. You wanna make sure that you have a metal shovel and not a plastic shovel. Avalanche debris has the potential to set up like concrete, and you can just imagine what plastic is gonna do in that kind of debris. Um, so get a metal one, um, then beyond that, again, a lot of different models, a lot of different manufacturers out there. Uh, a few things maybe to think about are blade size, bigger blade, you're going to be able to move more snow more efficiently, a longer handle is going to be, or a longer shaft, excuse me, it's going to be much more efficient for moving snow. And then the handle type, the one we see in the photo here at the T handle, personally, I recommend a D handle. Um, and again, we'll go into more of that on our gear talk here. So that kind of wraps up the shovel. The third piece of the trifecta, the third leg of the stool here is going to be the probe. Um, and your probe is basically what allows you to push down in the snow to uh, kind of pinpoint your search from somebody who's buried underneath the snow. And so similarly with a beacon and a shovel, you're gonna see a variety of manufacturers, a variety of uh, models out there. And a few key takeaways on these guys is the material is made out of the length and um, good visual markings. And so material wise, again, we're gonna get into this stuff more in the gear talk, but you'll find aluminum, carbon and steel um, kind of in order from least durable to more, most durable. And then the lengths, you're gonna see anywhere from 240 centimeters to 320 plus. Um, and personally, I always recommend 260 plus. It's better to have it, have the length and not need it uh, than need it and not have it. And then also having good visual markings on the probe so you can see how deep that person actually is. So just a few uh, key takeaways, pro tips on the probe side. Um, and then uh, beyond that, a backpack you're going to need as well. Um, so a backpack, a variety again of manufacturers and models of backpacks out there. Um, above anything, recommend getting a snow sport specific backpack. And what that means is it's going to have a pocket that is solely dedicated for your beacon, your shovel, and your probe. Um, and then beyond that, think about the size of your pack. Um, you have a lot more stuff with us traveling in the backcountry than if we grab our ski pass and head to the resort. And so from a, a size standpoint, typically we like to recommend 30 liters or plus for your average day of touring. Um, ideally, you want to keep everything contained at the inside of the backpack. 
and again, we'll go over more of this in the gear talk next week, uh, but organize your backpack. Everything has a home and that's where it lives. And that's way, that way when you need to get something, you know exactly where to go to get it. Um, and then beyond that, another consideration would be your Avalanche airbag, which are great um, with the technology today, they've gotten better as far as the volume of them, um, not been taken away too much from the, from the uh, Avalanche airbag side of things. They're a little bit lighter weight. Um, and so great to have, it's just important to understand the limitations of when those aren't going to work and take an avalanche course and we'll be able to teach you a little bit more about that. Um, so that kind of hits on the main avalanche gear. And again, another thing I mentioned earlier is have a radio, um, communication is crucial. Um, and so I'm, I know we're going to talk more about that next week in the gear side as well. So that kind of wraps up our avalanche gear again. Just make sure you don't go in the backcountry without your big and shovel and probe and making sure that everybody you go out with has that as well. Um, so now that you have the gear, it's important to learn how to use it. So we'll quickly talk about some avalanche education resources. We will be delving more into the avalanche education side of things on week three here of the Slay at Home series. So we're just briefly going to cover these here now. Um, so as far as avalanche, avalanche education is concerned, you're going to see different outlets. You're going to see what you can try and see here, Airy. American Institute for Avalanche Research and Education. That's an organization who teach avalanche education. Uh, also the AAA American Avalanche Association and the American Avalanche Institute, AST in Japan. So long story short, there's a handful of prov providers out there, but we're all pretty much teaching the same stuff. You're gonna find different levels of training from a level one to a level two and a rescue course. So I just highly recommend you guys delve into that a little bit more. And again, on week three, we'll be talking a lot more about your avalanche education. Um, in the meantime, you can go to the ARI website, the AAA website, and you can find out providers and more information about what those courses are going to offer. Um, or better yet, reach out to me, Justin at ColoradoAdventureGuides.com, and we will be able to fill you in. Uh, so as Ben mentioned earlier, Weston is awesome in the sense that they are super keen to educating people in the backcountry and partnering with people uh, like us, guide services in the industry. So check out the Weston Guide Up page, um, check out your local provider, um, us here Colorado Adventure Guides, we're operating in Central Colorado, Sarah's down south. Um, so just look at your local provider um, and kind of find the, the best location that's for you as far as where to take it. Probably take best to take it in an area that you're gonna to be touring into. Um, or just come to Colorado because we have one of the most complex snowpacks in the world. And so we'll get you on top of the game here. Um, so you can see, again, a few links down there where you can click on to find your local providers. Um, again, just quickly touching on all that stuff because we're going to delve more into the avalanche education side here in a couple of weeks. And I just want to take a, a step back from the avalanche education, kind of where it seems where a lot of you guys are at right now before even signing up for an avalanche education course. We really want you guys to learn how to use your gear first. And this is where Pat will talk about it a little bit more here in a second as well. Um, sign up for an intro to backcountry ski or splitboarding course or find a mentor who is willing to take you out and teach you how to learn, the, learn how to use the gear. Because unfortunately, in a level one avalanche course, we're not able to teach you how to use your gear. We have so much other topics to focus on as far as recognizing avalanche terrain and understanding snow science a little bit more and understanding that process. And so there is a step before your avalanche education, and that's learning how to use your gear. And I know Pat's going to hit on this uh, here soon. Take an intro course, hire a guide, find a mentor, go on the resort and tour uphill. I know we'll hit on that a little bit here as well. Um, and as always, reach out if you have any questions with avalanche education. So on top of avalanche education, you want to make sure that you are well versed in first aid and rescue. Um, we cannot rely on anybody in the backcountry minus yourself and your touring partners. If you call for help, realistically, it's not going to be there for, your, for a few hours. And so traveling in the backcountry not only is understanding avalanche education, it's also understanding how to read a map and compass, orientation or orienteering skills, and your first aid skills. And so if you're going to be traveling into the backcountry, first thing you should do is sign up for a basic first aid CPR course. It's literally... A, a day or less of your time and it's life-saving skills that you're going to learn. So better yet, if you're going to be traveling in the backcountry, sign up for a wilderness first aid. That's a two-day course and it's going to teach you all these first aid topics in a wilderness setting. Um, personally, so Knowles, as we see here, another local uh, medical provider we recommend here is Desert Mountain Medicine. Um, just a plug for them real quick here local in Colorado, if you are a member of the CAIC, 
you get 10% off on their courses. Um, so that's pretty awesome just for that plug they're out there to help people get educated. Um, and then also, I guess on that note for CAG, similarly, you take a level one with us, we're going to discount you into those medical courses as well. It just really shows how important it is to get out there and get your medical training. Um, so get out there, get trained, make sure you have a first aid kit, take that course, learn what to put in your first aid kit, and then learn how to use it. Um, make sure you don't go out in the backcountry without it. I wouldn't necessarily say everybody in your group needs to have one, but you need to make sure that you have one adequate for your group size. Um, and then so a couple tips down there, Sam Splint, you're going to learn what that is and how to use it in a course. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, communication is key. So consider carrying a spot or an in reach if you guys are out of cell service. Um, ski straps are gold in the backcountry. And then make sure, along with first aid, you're carrying um, a bivy or a rescue sled so that you, if you do have to spend a night out there, you have adequate material to stay out overnight or to move somebody from a certain area to where a helicopter is going to land. And so we do cover some of that stuff in a companion rescue course as far as your evac considerations. Um, but long story short, it's not avalanche education only. Make sure you get first aid trained as well. Awesome. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it over here to Pat, and he's going to start filling us in on some fitness. All right. Thanks for all the information, Justin and Sarah. Hope you guys are enjoying the talk. Uh, it's been great so far. Man, I'm, I'm learning some stuff on this one, as always. Um, but yeah, fitness, not something to overlook as you're getting into split boarding. Um, by no means, not the, the biggest thing to think about, but something you want to consider as you get out and split board. So um, one thing I recommend is just simply moving through the mountains if you have access to them. Um, in the winter, we go and tour. Um, but during the off season, you know, just if you're playing in the mountains, uh, especially uh, focusing on vertical gain, whether it be through hiking, running, or biking, you're going to be a lot more effective out there on the skin track because we're just going uphill and then going downhill. So uh, anything that uh, focuses on vertical gain is going to be huge. Um, and then cross training, you know, we're using a lot of different muscle groups, um, touring and snowboarding. Um, you know, do what you already do if you have uh, some fun activities, skateboarding, rock climbing, whatever you're into. Um, I would say just go out there and do it regularly. Um, as you evolve in backcountry touring, that's when I got more into specific training, um, when I got more into snowboard mountaineering and, and those kind of activities. So, you know, I'd like to recommend focusing on the core and legs, squats, lunges, core workouts are great. There's some uh, great articles and tutorials on snowboard specific workouts. Um, so if you do a quick Google search, you'll find a lot of those, um, core workout for me, uh, one of the best ones to start with is Scott's killer core right out there from, uh, the uphill athlete, which is a great book and website. Um, and then rest and recovery. Um, we don't want to train or, or do any activities if we're not fully recovered. So if you're not feeling fully recovered, take another rest day. And me, you know, I'm in my mid thirties. So stretching, yoga, foam rolling, those are all very important tools for me to get out there and uh, keep uh, pushing hard in the back country, quality sleep, good nutrition, adequate hydration, you know, the same kind of key things we need to think about for any sport. Um, but especially for moving in the back country, we're out there in the elements uh, going up and downhill and doing a lot of different activities kind of in the same, same major thing. All right, getting out for your first tour. Um, yeah, if you want to go to the next slide there, Ben. So, you know, you just want to set some expectations. Um, how good of a skier or rider do I need to be? You know, for me, I recommend people to be a, you know, an expert snowboarder or skier in the backcountry, or I'm sorry, on the resort. Um, you definitely want to know what you're doing um, and know how to move on expert terrain uh, to be in the backcountry. Now I've been out with people that, you know, are maybe confident blue or single black diamond skiers. Um, and that's fine. You just need to adjust your terrain that you're going to ride um, to be in line with your skill set. Um, but if you're going to get into backcountry touring as kind of a main activity, you definitely want to be an expert uh, resort rider or skier already. Um, what to expect for your first tour? Well, expect to use muscle groups you might not have used ever. Skinning is a very specific motion. It's going to use different muscle groups you probably haven't used, so you're going to feel sore the next day um, for different things. It might be really hard to 
move around on your split board going uphill. It's kind of a specific uh, movement that takes a little while to dial using skins um, and poles. Um, so just, you know, expect to have a lot of new first things uh, on that tour. Um, am I in danger? Well, that all depends on where you're going to be uh, recreating. So, you know, if you're going to be recreating in anything that's uh, avalanche terrain, which is, you know, a term that you'd learn uh, more about in a area one or an avalanche course, um, then yes, you very well may. So if that is in question at all, I recommend going out with a mentor or better yet going out um, taking a, a guided day with someone like Colorado Venture Guides, Justin or I, or take an intro to Splitboard course, and we'll we'll go over you know that question uh, in a bit in a bit more detail. Um, how long is the typical tour? Well, that can last anywhere from you know one or two hours to a whole day, and that's going to range on your fitness level, uh, the time you have uh, to put into that day, the terrain you might be recreating in, um, and what your expectations are. So. You know, when I started split boarding, a typical tour for me was one run, you know, um, until my fitness level got higher um, and I could go out there and uh, do more runs, go up and downhill a lot more. You know, one run was usually enough. Uh, but now, you know, I'm, you know, I'd, I'd like to do five or six thousand feet of vert in a day. So it all depends on kind of where you're at, um, your fitness level and um, the type of terrain you're moving in, but, you know, keep it small to start. We don't want to go out and uh, try to kill it on the first day. Um, and that kind of gets to how many runs will I get in, you know, for me, uh, again, uh, one run to start. Um, but as you recreate more, you can get more and more runs in. So all depends. And, uh, you know, a guided trip is going to help you um, kind of get an idea of that as well. Uh, what did the season look like for the backcountry, and what to look out for in those time frames? So that's going to change uh, based on the region. Here in Colorado, sometimes we start in October, sometimes we start in November, sometimes we start in December. You know, it's looking like uh, uh, November to December this year, um, just with our snowpack and the lack thereof. Um, but it can go all the way to July. Um, it can, you know, it could be all year round if you're going to chase that snow that, that sits up in the high mountains. Um, but generally, it's you know anywhere from late October, November um, to early uh, spring or um, early summer, June, July here in Colorado, for example. And the type of riding you're going to be doing um, is going to vary greatly. You know, in the beginning, you're going to be riding uh, the type of terrain that's uh, pretty low angle. Um, with avalanche danger a little bit higher typically, especially in Colorado, um, a lot more obstacles when the snowpack is lower. Um, so we're looking out for what we call sharks, rocks and trees and stumps. So, you know, keeping it pretty mellow. And as the uh, season progresses, that's when we can start riding hopefully deeper snow. And then as it progresses into spring, um, hopefully the snowpack's consolidating. That's when typically uh, Justin, Sarah and I will go out and you looking for uh, higher angle terrain when the snowpack dictates that we can get in there and ride some more interesting stuff. So, yeah. All right, introduction to backcountry. Um, so many outfitters offer an intro to backcountry or an intro to split spinning course. Um, Justin and I both teach one at Colorado Adventure Guides. I think it's one of the most applicable and useful courses you can take. Um, some of the benefits, um, is trying the gear before you buy it. We have a whole demo fleet of Weston uh, split boards with spark bindings. Um, so you can try different boards before you, you know, are gonna go invest in one. You know, there's a lot of different shapes, a lot of different uh, models for different riding styles. Um, and you might wanna, you know, try different boards at different length um, to get it dialed for your weight and height and, you know, riding style. Um, you can find some safe zones in the beginning uh, that might be difficult to do on your own. Um, and we're also going to go through, you know, how we plan a trip. And that's one of the biggest things um, you need to kind of get in the mindset of when you're touring on your own, um, looking at the avalanche forecast, looking at the weather, uh, looking at the terrain that we might be riding that day and putting it all together to have a safe tour that's in line with the, that weather and that avalanche forecast. Um, so just that's something we're going to do on an intro to split boarding course, uh, go right through those steps and then go out and execute in the field and having those plan A, B, C's, uh, backups, if you will, um, in case the, the terrain doesn't allow us to ride what we planned. Um, but 
we also uh, offer a plethora of skinning techniques um, that make your area one more productive. As Justin mentioned, you know, he doesn't have time when he's uh, teaching an area one course to go through skinning techniques and how to just move around in the backcountry. So on an intro to snowboarding or an intro to splitboarding or intro to a backcountry skiing course, we're going to teach you that. We're going to get your technique dialed, um, how to use your risers, when to use certain skinning techniques uh, in the backcountry. And then a single day with a guide is likely cheaper than a lift ticket. Um, so reach out to us, um, see what we can do for you on intro to backcountry or intro to skiing course. And uh, it's just the best way, hands down, to get in the backcountry. You're gonna go with a guide. You don't have to worry about, am I in avalanche terrain? Um, am I in the right terrain for my ability level? We're gonna uh, help you decide that and, and make sure you're gonna have a nice safe day and have fun and learn a lot. <laughs> All right, dealers demos and uh, resort uphill. So we also demo at a ton of different ski resorts. Um, so you can demo a split board or AT setup and take it out to your local resort day. Um, benefits of that is you don't have to worry about avalanche hazards. You're in bounds in uh, uh, ski patrol uh, patrol terrain. Um, so just something that you won't even have to worry about that entire aspect. Um, side country access is often the first backcountry people experience. Um, but we want to make sure that, you know, to know side country is, is a term for, for back country. Um, so the minute you step out of the gate, you are in back country and, and it's not something the ski patrol is going to manage. Uh, but you're likely, you know, if you're staying in bounds, you're likely to know your zones already. So, you know, if you know Breckenridge Ski Resort, for example, really, really well, um, you're going to be able to dial uh, this footboard um, in your own zone in uh, terrain you're comfortable with. And another big thing for me is, is when you get a split board, uh, you're gonna wanna make some adjustments, whether it be with the, uh, the angles of your bindings or your width or whatever else. So it's just a lot easier to make those adjustments at the ski resort and go down to the bottom, hit the lodge, use the, uh, uh, the screwdrivers down there and sit in the back country, maybe winds in your face. It's a lot harder to uh, kind of make adjustments to your split board in the field. Um, some of the cons, less pow, unless you get it on a pow day. So great time to have your split board because um, your split board is probably going to be a more pow specific board anyways. But um, hopefully when you do take it out there and demo it, it's going to be in good snow, but that's always up in the air. Um, resort runs can be more difficult to skin and then we have uphill access policies. So something to, to think about, you know, if you have a resort in mind um, that you want to demo a split board, you just want to go and maybe check with um, them to see what their uphill resort policies are. All right, and split fest and backcountry demos. Split fests are one of my uh, favorite things in split boarding. And unfortunately this year, it might be tough um, with the split fest um, and backcountry demos just with the, the COVID-19 um, and the environment around that. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought there was another slide in there. Um, another thing to note about the split fests, a lot of them are going to be online this year um, if they can't hold them in person. So look out for uh, ones, um, any of the, the popular split fests out there, um, if they're going to be running uh, online Zoom webinars, just like we're doing right now, uh, might be just as much uh, to learn um, without it being in person. So yeah, I just kind of look out on Facebook or any of their websites to see what they're, uh, they're doing if they're not able to hold them in person. All right, ready to drop in? Probably not quite. So some good next steps um, before we get out there in the backcountry. Um, fitness, we want to start hiking and training. So, you know, I just keep it simple to start. You know, if you go out and do 14ers in the summer, that's a great way to kind of get fit uh, for the winter. You know, just going outside and moving is, uh, is a great start. Um, dabble for, you know, for some people, it might be wise to try the sport for before jumping in. Um, so consider a backcountry 101 or a splitboard 101 guided trips with gear rentals. You don't have to commit to the huge investment that splitboarding is. Um, before you might know that you're already interested in it or not. Um, guided up trips are great too, a little more involved. Uh, being out in the backcountry for a little longer time is super cool. 
And then uh, a new company out there, Bluebird Backcountry, up towards Kremlin has managed resort demos. Um, so uh, something to look into if you're looking to just kind of learn the backcountry uh, kind of more in a controlled environment. Um, some of the gear. So start looking at what you'll need and focus on the avi and boarded ski. So, you know, if you're going to uh, commit to a splitboard setup, you, you definitely need to commit to that beacon shovel probe. Um, Justin was talking about that medical kit, some kind of uh, medical know-how, you know, all those things are very important. Um, so we have a packing list on our website right there. There's the URL. Go ahead and check it out. It's a super comprehensive, great start. And then a tender view, get the gear, backcountry gear recommendations. Um, so we're going to have, that's another talk we'll have on November 12th. Education. So a huge, uh, important asset uh, for being a solid backcountry person is just being educated. So look into AVI education, wilderness first aid courses, um, a tender view on where you're going to have a, a talk on the 19th, get to the education, avalanche education programs. Um, we'll, we'll go more into that. Um, get some books. You know, I'm getting ready for an avalanche course. So I have, well, maybe we can see it. Uh, Bruce Tremper is staying alive in avalanche terrain. So I'm just reading up, getting prepared for the season. So um, some great literature out there. Definitely recommend staying alive in avalanche terrain as a first great book. And then check out the partner guide ops. Um, they're on our guide ops page uh, on the Weston uh, Backcountry website. And then practice. Get your partners out there that you might be heading to the backcountry with. Use your beacon shovel probe. Um, start practicing now. Uh, skin on the resorts, skin on local, local sledding hills. You know, you don't have to commit to going into the backcountry in order to learn how to use how to use your uh, split board, your poles, your skins. Um, something you can do in maybe a warmer, more controlled manner because doing it out there in the backcountry when the snow is in your face, the wind uh, when you're above tree line is, is a much harder to learn. And then, yeah, start practice transitioning uh, from your setup uh, ride ski and then back down to uh, tour mode. Um, that's just gonna dial you in in the backcountry. It's never easy, easier out there than it is, you know, practicing in, in a more controlled environment. And then attend our next sessions. You know, we've been given some dates out for our next talks and we'd love to see you at those. All right, so um, now we're gonna kind of get into the, the Q&A. Thanks so much, Pat, a uh, killer job. And um, the other guides, feel free to turn on your video, turn on your mics, um, jump in here, and we will try to go through some of these questions that you guys have been asking. We you know answered several in the chat here, uh, but we will kind of open this up to, to Q&A. You guys let us know if you have any questions. Um, Ellen, feel free to jump on here too and let me know what's going on in the Q&A. And yeah, if any of you guys have answered questions, feel free to just um, state those questions real quick and let people know the answers. So there was one about um, when do you need crampons and do you need crampons? Um, is that like one of the items of gear that you should buy like right, at, right out of the gate? My answer to that is no. I don't think you need crampons right away. Um, a lot of skin tracks, if it's a really popular skin track, it can get really hard and really challenging to move up. So down the road, if you wanna invest in a pair of crampons, they're super light, you can just throw them in your pack and um, they can be really valuable on really overused skin tracks as well as steeper, icier, um, wind blown or, uh, uh, yeah, like I see terrain. So yeah. Any additions to that? Yep. I would agree with that. Like you don't need them. They're not mandatory just to get into split boarding, but they are very useful tools and you'll probably need those before you need boot specific crampons. Right. And we're going to go into detail next week on crampons and boots and what you need to buy first and when, but kind of the general answer is you don't really need them at first. Um, after you get into split boarding, you'll start getting into places where you might need them, like a, a skin track or there a side hill that's a little bit icy, you know, in a no fall zone, an area you want just some extra traction and some extra safety, perhaps. Uh, so yeah, Justin, Pat, anything else to add to that? Uh, 
Yeah, for me, you know, I use them a lot in the spring. If I know the approach is going to be somewhere that gets a lot of sun, it's going to be refrozen, um, kind of a, a terrain specific one. If I know uh, an aspect is going to be refrozen and I got to move on it and it's kind of steeper terrain. Um, but usually there's an event that you have there that you're sliding around and and it's that's going to mark, hey, I need crampons next time. So, you know, the ski crampons a lot of time are like, okay, you know, that sucked a lot. So I'm going to go and invest in one and, and you'll kind of, you know, your understanding of when you need them will evolve with it. Now, just to throw one more thing out there, uh, I would also say it would somewhat depend upon where you are touring. Um, that will kind of be dictating the, the snow climate you're going to be touring into. You'll learn more of this in an avalanche class, but if you're touring on the coast, you're going to find more hard packed and crusty conditions midwinter than we would here in Colorado. And so if you're in that kind of area, you might want to look into them more than if you're in Colorado where we don't see that kind of um, snow surface typically until spring. Um, but yeah, like Ben said, not something I would stress on off the bat. Yep. Um, I think a good question I saw in there, are we ready to move on? Yeah, and what, one more note on the, the crampons is, is most manufacturers make a specific crampon that would only fit their bindings. So if you get spark bindings, you'll need a spark crampon most likely. Um, a product I tend to use are called skin cleats. Um, and those work with, with anything, skis, split boards, anything. Uh, you know, that's kind of a cool alternative, um, but they're not, they don't bite quite as deep as those other crampons. But we'll, we'll kind of mention all the different styles of crampons and stuff too next week. So a really good question somebody had is, is are there any facilities that will allow you to rent uh, backcountry gear like Beacon Pro Shovel and of course Splitboard? Um, and my response to that to the whole group was some outdoor programs at universities will do that, some guiding services will do that. And I wanted to ask Justin, do you guys do that? I'm sorry, I was asking, answering some questions. What was yeah, that? no, sorry. Justin, do you guys at Colorado Adventure Guides offer uh, backcountry equipment rentals? We do. Yeah, we have Weston ski or Weston um, split boards, and then we have a, a handful of ski manufacturers, K2, Icelandic, and Faction, and then we also have Avalanche gear through Ordebox, Beacon Shovel Probe, and Avalanche Fax. Nice. Right on. Perfect. Um, and just so everyone knows, um, these videos are recorded and you will be able to watch them after. We will release them on our website, on our Facebook page here in the next few days. So anybody that missed it can still tune in and check it out. Um, the next question in the chat I saw was on radios um, from Marika Roback. Hopefully I'm getting that right. Uh, but you know, it's about radios. I really recommend the BCA link mainly because it works great. I've had situations and I've had a lot of radios in the past that didn't work or I couldn't hear someone on. And the only radio I could hear someone stuck in a tree well was the BCA. And since that day, that's the only radio I've used. I heard someone stuck in a tree well from our van at a trailhead. And the rest of the people in her party could not hear her on their radios. And I was able to help and facilitate a rescue only because I had that radio. Um, Rugged Radio is another really cool radio I've been wanting to try out. We use those in the summer a lot, also in motorized tours. Um, and so those are another great radio, but just because most people already have the BCA link, you know it's gonna function well with most people in your party. So that's the main reason I still run the link, but I'm always open to other radios, but that's what I've found works the best so far. Someone asked about using ice climbing boots to split board with. Oh, that was the Spantix. I saw that one. I actually did ride those personally for a couple of years when I was living in Alaska. Um, I ended up switching back to soft boots from the Spantix personally. Um, I didn't like the, the heel to toe transition. Um, I know a couple of other split boarders who do actually ride the Spantix specifically. Um, so I guess it would be a bit of personal preference, but that is a boot that you will see some, some, uh, split borders utilizing. Sweet. Yep. I met a guy when I was on Denali who had a pair of Spantix and he said he hated them and it ruined his trip. <laughs> um, but also any kind of boot like that, you want to think about height, you know, snowboard boots are, are, 
are pretty high on your calf and that gives you that support and your, and your turning ability. So whenever you have a boot, that's going to sit super low, it, you, it might not snowboard the same way as a traditional snowboarder or ski boot would. Perfect. Um, we have a question about split fest websites. Um, and so there's a, a huge variety of split fest here in Colorado. We have front range split fest that Weston throws. So you can just Google front range split fest. Um, Silverton split fest is another great split fest down in the San Juans here in Colorado. Wasatch split fest is a great split fest over in Utah. Um, the Bozeman Split Fest is a great split fest up in Bozeman, Montana. Canuck Split Fest is actually happening in January. It's usually the first split fest of the season, and that's one that we like to try to hit up every year if we can. Um, and that's an amazing split fest up near Rogers Pass in Revelstoke, British Columbia. Um, so that one's a fantastic destination split trip. Um, there's also a great one called Baker Split Fest, which is, you know, if not the longest running, it's one of the bigger split fests too up in uh, Mount Baker, Washington, right outside of Glacier. So those are all the ones we hit up. There's also some great ones in the Northeast, Bolton Valley, um, I know is not going on this season. Um, it's going to be replaced by splitboardvermont.com. Um, so you might, you know, be looking for that, but all these split fests have Facebook groups that you can kind of check out. That's usually how they operate. Um, and a lot of great backcountry ski demo days as well. But like, like kind of Pat mentioned, this year they're going to be tough. Um, I would just, you know, Google Split Fest or, you know, check out some of the ones I mentioned. We also helped throw Hokkaido Split Fest over in Japan, um, which debuted last season. And um, we're involved in other Split Fest like Split and Relax over in Europe and, and another Split Fest down in New Zealand. So um, always looking for awesome Split Fest. You guys let us know um, if you're tuning in from somewhere else, uh, we're always looking for cool split fest to attend. Cool. Are you guys gonna cover clothing tips in next week's talk, your talk? We are indeed. We'll kind of get into layering and the different kinds of fabrics and, and things that we recommend, uh, you know, everything from base layers to your mid layers to your outer layers. Sweet. Um, so all of the videos from these chats will be available afterwards. Someone said they have a prior commitment for next yep. week's talk. So uh, we can find those on Weston's website, West, right? Weston's Facebook page. Um, they'll be posted on the education tab on our website. You can also find them in the Weston Backcountry community page. Perfect. So lot, lots of different options to watch them. Um, I'm seeing a question about pace here. Are skiers versus split boarders able to have the same uh, or similar uphill pace? And so I, I would say that at this point, absolutely, if their fitness levels are the same, right? The actual transition time difference, like, yes, it takes a little bit longer to put a snowboard together and slide some bindings on, but it's really negligible on a, you know, a five to 10 hour day. It's just such a small portion there. Um, if you're riding with people that rip their skins off and leave you in the mountains, you probably shouldn't be touring with those people in the first place, right? You, you want to spend time and, you know, it's the goal is to, to enjoy the top of a line, right? I, I usually bust out some snacks and take photos. And that was the whole point of why I got there. You know, it's not a race. I tend to, spend my time in the backcountry with people that, that just go at the same pace. My, you know, the guy I spend the most time with in the backcountry is a skier and we do just fine. So if anything, I just make him break trail and we get along just fine. Thanks. Yes, uh, to note on that, you do want to skier in the group in order to get through those flats with a lot of deep snow. You know, they're going to make the track <laughs> for you. <laughs> Seriously, right? Yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. It's hard when you're the guide when you're supposed to go first. Right. <laughs> um, so popular, is there a resource for popular backcountry zones? Um, there is an app that you can buy. I think it's pretty cheap. It's called Rackup. I think it's R-A-K-K-U-P. Yep. And there's also some really good guidebook resources out there that you can find um yeah i like backcountry recon pretty good website powder project 
um, you know, hit their hit or miss on location, but can provide some good spots. Yep. Mm -hmm. Fat Maps is the same way. You know, I think five, 10 years ago, guidebooks were really your only option other than a, a good mentor or friend that would show you some zones. Um, and obviously, you know, the guidebook uh, market is, is exploded and there's all kinds of amazing guidebooks out there from one of our, you know, team skiers, Fritz Sperry um, and favorite authors, I believe even Pat's made some appearances in his books. Um, two of these online programs now like Rack Up, we're going to be doing some talks with Beacon Guidebooks, and we're actually going to be giving several of these webinars on local zones. The first one will debut, I believe, in January that will focus on Colorado specifically, but we'll be breaking up Colorado into several different zones and highlighting some really cool areas to go and explore to kind of give you all some, some ideas to, to get off of those main passes along I-70 and really spread out in the backcountry since we all know there's gonna be a big influx, but we're gonna to touch on um, the Cascades up in the Pacific Northwest, the Sierras over on the West Coast, um, we'll probably hit the White Mountains up in Vermont, um, try to add New England in there. We're going to have talks on e even specifically some, some really badass national parks like Rocky Mountain National Park, Teton National Park, even um, Rogers Pass up there in BC. So, so we're going to really get into a lot of cool resources for you all. Um, but really guidebooks um, is, is certainly a, a great way to, to really get a lay of land, start picking some objectives. Uh, and kind of set some goals. Yeah, nice. Um, there's a question about ski specific fests, ski backcountry fests, and where you can demo some backcountry skis. Does anybody know anything about that? You know, there's there's backcountry ski demos all over. I, I would just Google it. I think this season it's going to be tough. I think your best bet to demo equipment this year is going to be to contact your local mountaineering store and dealer, right? Because they're going to have demos. Like for, for example, you know, a lot of our dealers have Weston demos. Some have skis, but, but most any mountaineering shop. Um, at this point in the game should have backcountry setups to demo. And that's probably your best bet. Normally, you know, I could tell you about one almost every weekend, but I think this season, it's just going to be a little different. I'll just throw a quick plug in real quick. We are partnering with, if you're up here in this area anyways, uh, Gravity House Hotel in Breckenridge, where we are doing some demo days starting in the middle of December. Um, and so we're partnering with um, local manufacturers. So Weston is going to be one of them. Um, from a split board side and from a ski side we have faction um and i believe icelandic might be joining in so if you guys want to reach out to me directly or you can follow along on our website because we will be doing some of the demo days and it's going to include both ski and split board manufacturers and also on that day we're doing a kind of abbreviated version of that intro to backcountry ski and split board course and so you you can kick you can uh show up to this demo day you can get a set of demo skis or split board and then sign up for this course and we'll go out there and we'll teach you how to use it. And then at the end of that day, we're actually doing an avalanche 101 presentation clinic. So just to throw that out, if you guys are here in Colorado, you're local, um, starting in December, we are going to be doing some demoing um, outside of Breckenridge. Right on. Um, we're at San Juan Expeditions. We're doing some Western sponsored intro courses. One of them is on January 3rd, it's a co-ed intro to slipboarding and you'll have the chance to demo um, some really great Western boards. And then on January 23rd, we're doing a female specific intro to backcountry. And so we'll be having, uh, we'll have some Western and uh, boards and skis available to demo during that course as well. Um, we're also doing two airy specific, uh, women's specific area courses down there in the San Juans. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions about that, feel free to reach out. I put my contact information in the chat. Killer. Um, you guys open up the Q&A and see if we missed anything in the q and A. I I can't open it while I'm sharing here. We have one uh, about any tips for East Coast tours? Um, I've never split on these coasts. Um, any, anybody have any tips on that? 
I'm there with you, Pat. Come see us in maybe, Colorado. <laughs> yeah, maybe find a, a good deep snowpack. I don't, you know, I know places in the East Coast, such as New England, um, has a much deeper snowpack than say I'm from Pennsylvania, and uh, it's a when I, growing up in Pennsylvania, you know, the season was was hit or miss and, and never deep enough to really split board. So um, definitely find a zone that's deep enough to do so. Yeah, and I think definitely connecting with the local guide service like, um, you know, Acadia Mountain Guides, um, that would be a great way to to learn some good regions out there. There's, you know, also some great nonprofits like um, Granite Backcountry Alliance out there. Um, that you could check out. I think they're down in New Hampshire. And then um, you've got um, an organization up in um, the Northeast as well. A couple of different great nonprofits to check out up there. Um, so I would definitely do that as well. Yeah, there's a lot of good information coming through in the chat to answer that question too. So. Yeah, Catamount Trail Association. That's the other one I was trying to think about. They're up in Vermont. Normally they sponsor Bolton Valley. We're doing a bunch of stuff with them um, this year as well. So they're leading some tours um, out of Outdoor Gear Exchange up at a, in Burlington, Vermont. So you can check out some stuff there. Um, also just, you know, that Weston Backcountry Community page. Um, that is a big group of people. A lot of our guides are in there. Um, that is a great spot to be like, hey guys, you know, I'm looking for touring partners. I'm looking to meet up with people. I'm looking for beta on zones. Um, so definitely make use of that for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep, or Splitboard Northeast is another fantastic uh, group that you can check out. Facebook, man, I'm telling you, there, there's regional specific backcountry groups in, in wherever you're at most likely. So if there's not, start one. There's a question about phantom permanent wax. Uh, that's a DPS skis one. Anybody have any experience with that? I do not. I use Pearl. It's a great wax. Go check that out. Yeah, I'm I, the same. Yeah, I love waxing my board. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know that I would take that away from me um, the night before a powder day. It's kind of a ritual at this point. Um, yeah, I also ride pearl wax. I like changing up my wax depending on the temperature. I'm crazy picky. Um, I, that being said, I haven't tried the phantom wax. I've heard great things. I know a lot of people have tried it. I got a sample and left it sitting on my desk and I continue to use pearl. So. Cool. Well, all right. Any other questions we will make sure and get answered in our blog that we're going to release after this. Um, we've got a cool little outro video about a new project from a few of our team riders to kind of say goodbye. But thank you guys for all tuning in tonight. And we will see you next week on the next edition of the Slay at Home Speaker Series. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, guys. Take care. Got fun out there. All right. Uh, what motivates you to snowboard? Uh, what motivates me the most is just the freedom of being in the forest and just the silence and the peace and quiet and experiencing that with some of your closest friends is uh, what kind of keeps me going. Everybody, thanks again for tuning in. We will see you next week.